The moment All For One teleported the villains in front of the heroes, not even Shigaraki could convince Dobby to stay put. Excited by the sight of his dear father, Dobby unleashed a mountain-sized attack to burn them all, but was countered by an ice attack that was just as big. Dobby smiled through the bitter cold as to emerge from a shadowy vortex, it was Shoto, who, with his classmates backing him up, refused to let his big brother have his way. Just like Endeavor, Dobby called out to Shoto with maddening enthusiasm. To interrupt them, All Might deployed Operation Troy. Several metal cages sprouted from the ground simultaneously, trapping the villainous forces in one fell swoop. Almost immediately after breaking free, Dobby taunted the heroes and their worthless cages, which didn't even last three seconds. But according to Shoto, three seconds were all they needed. Charging in with all the other heroes, their objective was simple lock the villains down, and break them up into smaller groups. Thanks to this, Monoma was able to use Kuragiri's Warp Gate quirk to send them all to different battlefields. In the Kamino Award, it was now Shoto, Ida, and Endeavor sidekicks versus Dobby and a near high-end Nomu. Staring each other down, the oldest and youngest Todoroki boys were now fully prepared to go all out. Moments later, the entire city was dwarfed by massive flames. Dobby mocked the hero's dwindling numbers. The Nobu seemed to have already claimed a victim, and they were currently faced by a raging sea of fire. Clinging to the All Might statue, although it had only been a few months ago, Dobby couldn't help feeling a bit nostalgic. He remembered how seeing the Hosu incident inspired him to finally take action. Ida called out to Shoto as he flame spiraled upward. The heat alone was unbearable. If he got any closer, he would no doubt ruin his engines. From there, Dobby took to the skies while apologizing for talking so much. Yet again, Endeavor wasn't paying any attention to him, and it was really killing his mood. Standing above them all, he wondered if his father's answer to him was really just his third son and three of his little helpers. Over his shoulder, Onima told Kido that he'd better keep back since his body wouldn't be able to handle the heat. But Kido insisted that he'd be fine thanks to his quirk being able to alter the trajectory of the hot air. Unraveling to reveal his face just a bit, he intended to remain calm and logical. He had been working as a hero like this for more than 10 years, and was here to follow orders because he wanted to. Despite all the family drama, Vernon and the others still respected Endeavor for always showing up and getting the job done, and today was no different. They were fully prepared to support Shoto through it all. Shoto thanked her, but laughing, Vernon urged him to save his energy instead. Shoto called out to his brother as Toya, then as Dobby. He wanted to set the record straight. He wasn't here on anyone else's orders. He was here because he made the decision to stop his brother. This only made Dobby see Shoto as their father's perfect little pawn. According to Shoto, if he ignored his brother despite still trying to be a hero, that might just be true. Dobby could see his point. To him, this war was all about the people involved. The mindless soldiers that were just following orders weren't the ones really shaking things up. This was the result of everyone having feelings and urges that have boiled over. Some of them wanted to change the world, while others wanted to destroy it. The warped imbalances accumulated and became the norm. Dobby saw this as the limit of superhuman society. That's what he was. That's what they all were. Shoto paused before asking a question. If Dobby survived the accident, why didn't he come back home? Since Shoto really wanted to know, villain or not, Toya was still a big brother here. So as his flesh burned away, he had no problem sharing the story of how he became Dobby. He would also explain why he's still alive and never stopped burning hotter than even Endeavor's masterpiece. Above the immovable symbol of peace like their father always desired, Dobby couldn't help but smile at his little brother. 11 years ago at Sakoto Peak, Toya was burning alive thanks to his own quirk gone horribly wrong. Despite the overwhelming pain, still wanting to show his father what he could do, Toya refused to die and ran towards a small lake. And that's where All For One found him, the boy that was born with everything. After that, Toya suddenly woke up somewhere else. Looking around, he was hooked up to an IV. First, he wondered where he was. Then he wondered if he was even still alive. Noticing him, two young girls were excited to see that Mr. Sleepyhead had finally woken up. He immediately asked them what this place was, but was shocked by the sound of his own voice. One of the girls told him that this was where they live, while the other ran off looking for a doctor. They'd tell him that he had been asleep for three years. 
or at least that's what the doctor said. Hearing this, Toya was even more concerned. He needed to go back home. But the sunflower-headed helper refused to let him. He insisted that they were his new family, and from now on, Toya would need to live with them. But Toya couldn't accept this. He was sure that his dad was just too busy with work to come and see him. With an uncertain smile, he tried his best to convince himself that his dad must be really worried about him. He recognized that what he had said and done before leaving were wrong. He wanted to go home and apologize to his mother and siblings. After all, his dad still needed to see what he was really capable of. But that's when a mysterious voice told the boy that sadly, his hope was in vain. Restoring Toya's burnt and broken body was quite the task. His missing pieces had to be replaced with regenerative tissue. He was a changed man. Toya did not understand. The voice elaborated by saying that the child would never be able to use his power like he had before. All his organs were damaged. His senses and ability to feel pain were all dulled. His body was debilitated and he would never be the same again. Toya was too stunned to speak. Despite their best efforts to preserve his full strength, they failed to do so. Toya was overwhelmed by thoughts of being a failure to his father. Realizing the boy's suffering, the voice believed it may be possible to restore Toya's firepower to how it was before. The voice then asked Toya if he would join their family. Holding his face, Toya told the voice to shut up. Crying, he refused to be trained by anyone other than Endeavor. Because he had already been so molded by his upbringing, it was too late for them to lead him. Not even All for One could exploit Toya's obsession with Endeavor. Toya burned the entire place to the ground. All of those children were spares in case anything happened to All for One's primary vessel, Shigaraki. Dobby was intended to be one of those spares, a failed experiment. They gave up on Dobby and let him run free because after waking up, his body shouldn't have even lasted for more than a month. When Jiren brought him to the League of Villains, All for One and the Doctor were shocked and wondered how he could possibly still be alive. When he came to collect Hood, Dobby recognized the Doctor to be the one who restored him. The whole reason the Doctor selected Dobby for this task in the first place was so that he could see what he was really thinking. Looking at the high-end Nomu, Dobby had a better understanding of what they originally planned to do with him. The reason he'd returned was because this seemed to be the perfect place for his funeral. That one look told Dr. Garaki everything. Dobby had overcome death and remained tethered to this world thanks to the burning flames of vengeance in his heart. In the present, Dobby admitted to Shoto that he did actually go back home. Despite being weaker than ever and knowing that he would never be able to be trained by his father ever again, he still wanted to be seen. He was sure that something must have changed. That was all he wanted to see. Instead, after three long years, he saw the same heartbreaking scene. The reason he was born. He was a failed creation. His life was pointless. Endeavor had simply moved on to Shoto. Their family had left him behind in their past. To him, when you cross certain limits, the things that once shaped you lose all meaning. He dedicated himself to making his flame stronger. That way, he wouldn't be so weak the next time they'd meet. His body continued to burn and rot, but he didn't feel anything. He studied their father's battle movies over and over. Onima had a bad feeling about this. Shoto agreed. Dabi had been prepared to die from the very beginning. Every time Endeavor protected the city, every time he got a boost in popularity. His heart pounded like crazy ever since Toya died and Dobby was born. Heat is energy born from living things as they move and thrive. All for one, a being that seeks to live forever had no use for such an insane heat that rushed towards death. Dobby's flames became hot enough to liquefy All Might's statue. All for one himself, had to abandon the fatal flames of insanity. Both brothers prepared their father's signature technique, the flash fire fist. Dobby decided that burning away everything Endeavor cares about would be the proof of his own existence. But Shoto wasn't going to let that happen. The flash fire fist is a super move created by Endeavor that builds up internal heat to its utmost limit before unleashing it as an attack. When Endeavor mastered it in his quest for power, he truly recognized his own limitations. That very fire then produced a shimmering heat haze that distorted and warped all they looked upon. Most of all, his family. 
Thanks to that little rant, Dobby was all fired up again. Channeling his power, Shoto recognized that Dobby was faster than him at raising his temperature. There was no hesitation at all. Preparing himself, Dobby realized that even if their father wasn't here, Shoto could still end up being perfect kindling. Shoto watched as the statued visage of All Might melted into nothingness. Shoto declared himself to be the one that will stop his brother. Dobby paused for a second before clearing things up a bit more. He had been preparing to kill Shoto for years too. Back when he was still in his weakened state, turning up his firepower was all he knew. Endeavor's belief that his eldest son's potential surpassed his own was a major source of encouragement. This was ideal for following his lead with max output. Dobby finally began his attack. He wondered if Shoto was a fan of All Might. Endeavor's sidekicks all prepared themselves. Dobby's Hell Spider raked across the battlefield in all directions. The heat was unbearable. It was like Endeavor's, only it was much bigger and far less contained. Ida immediately worried about Shoto. Thankfully, they just barely managed to defend against it. Shoto's attack was finally ready. But before anyone could realize, Dobby skidded behind them, melting the very ground beneath his feet. His speed was insane. Hell Spider was just a distraction. Dobby had a question of his own for his little brother. Dobby's fiery fist crashed into the scarred side of Shoto's face, then launched him like a rocket into the ground with overwhelming firepower. Dobby wanted to know how Shoto felt while he hid with those scared civilians at Yue, while all this madness was going on. Son of Endeavor, brother of Dobby. As he leapt towards a barely defending Shoto, Dobby wondered if the boy had no shame at all. Dobby's firepower had surpassed even Endeavor's, but this heat was way too much. Dobby berated his brother for having the ideal body, training, and environment, yet still clinging to and depending on others. Shoto was born with everything, but was too much of a coward to own it. And since no one had the guts to tell him the truth, Dobby decided to do the honors. He saw Shoto as a half-baked puppet. Reeling back with crazy firepower, Dobby didn't believe Shoto would ever amount to anything. With Jet Burn, he plunged Shoto into the face of a nearby skyscraper. But after, Dobby noticed some ice melting on his arm. Shoto agreed with him. He struggled to find his way and was full of doubt as a half-baked fool. Dobby realized that Shoto had neutralized his heat. The younger Todoroki admitted that he thought Dobby was only focused on their father. But knowing that his brother was watching him all this time too, it made him happy. While trying to keep up with everyone else, he had stumbled upon the level beyond their father's peak technique. Using both fire and ice, Shoto explained that he had turned flash fire into a move made specifically to stop his brother. He may be a half-baked little brother, but he still had something to say. Their father was insane and their family was all screwed up. But when Dobby decided to burn all those people to death, that was his choice alone. Leaping from the tower with his new technique, Shoto declared that Dobby wouldn't be taking any more innocent lives. Dobby's eyes went wide just before Shoto struck him with flash fire fist, Phosphor, telling Dobby to aim all his rage at them instead. This was freezing impact, burning ice blade, a cold slash of fire that raked across Dobby's chest. Maybe this was the only way Shoto could cool his brother's head at this point. Dobby was sent flying back. He released twin flame torrents to slow the momentum. He also had the power to chill the inferno. Dobby had to admit that Shoto was really the perfect man for the job. Doing a backflip, Dobby was tired of Shoto going on and on about right and wrong choices. This confirmed it. Slamming down on the ground, he'd state how despite sharing the same blood, they really were nothing alike. Shoto could not maintain his new technique for very long and needed to get it going again. Dropping down and melting the very ground beneath them, mouth wide, Dobby again insisted that they were the absolute limits of superhuman society. That a warped rail could never connect with a straight and narrow one. Turning the cityscape volcanic, he'd express that they would always be running in parallel, but forever apart. He commanded Shoto to burn to death, dying for their sake. Some of the flames began to swirl. It was Endeavor's sidekicks. They had given it their all to protect Shoto and had finally reached their limit. The heat was even strong enough to burn Shoto. 
he'd tell them that he was sorry. But Vernon would tell him to save his energy just like before. But he wanted to say just one more thing. At the top of his lungs, he shouted, Thank you. His blood passed and passed. He had reclaimed so much for himself. Before he knew it, it seemed like everyone had gotten so far ahead. But his friends were always there waiting. Class A never left anyone behind. Building up his power to extreme levels, Shoto thought about how they were always there to reassure him. Moving at breakneck speeds, he rushed towards Dobby and told him that they are going to mingle whether he likes it or not. In this flood of molten cement, he'd beg his brother to just stop already. He would unleash Great Glacial Agar at point-blank range. This was a tale of two brothers. In the frozen and melted remnants of the city, they remained motionless together. Shoto was exhausted both physically and mentally, and Dobby had stopped moving completely. Just barely managing to get back up, Vernon raised her burned hand up to her communicator. Dobby had been secured. The minor heroes on the scene that stayed away from their fight couldn't imagine how painful it must have been, but were happy that Shoto had pulled it off. Shoto had really done it. He defeated Dobby of the Blue Flame. Now they just needed to follow his lead and take down the Big Nomu, which was the last one standing. Thanks to this major boost in morale, they were all prepared to throw everything they had at the monster, making good use of their superior numbers. These heroes had gotten the lucky draw here. It might be a totally different story if they also had to deal with any of the Tartarus escapees like Kunieda or Gashly. Once this fight was over, they would spread the luck by helping out others and evening the playing field. The news of Shoto's victory reached the command center. Although he knew how painful it must have been, All Might was so happy to know that Shoto had won. Despite some other difficulties, this was an incredible start for them, and All Might would be the one to tell their forces. News of Shoto's victory spread across each and every battlefield. Mina and Mineta had tears in their eyes when they heard the good news. Mount Lady's laughter was enough to shake those around her. She was happy to know that she had been worried about Shoto for nothing and realized how much she really loved the kid. Hiroshima showed up next to Mina and was all fired up. With Shoto having proved how much of a man he is, it was their turn to do their part and hold the defensive line. On another battlefield, Sato was prepared to properly congratulate Shoto once everything was over. Ojiro remembered all the doubters that believed Shoto would be outmatched. Over at Yue, Bakugo had a big smile on his face. He had expected nothing less from Shoto. Against the mutant army, President Mike loudly let everyone know. Shoji was proud of Shoto overwhelming his cruel duty while narrowly evading the oversized cleave attack of a massive spinner. To the huge gecko villain, the idea of Dobby losing was inconceivable. There was no way this could be true. It had to be propaganda to boost the morale of the heroes. Spinner remembered how Dobby refused any additional quirks from All for One. To Spinner, Dobby always had everything. A reason to continue living. A goal. He had power too. Everything that Spinner himself lacked. There was absolutely no way in hell that someone like him could ever lose. Back at Ground Zero, Ida looked at Shoto, who'd apologized for having stalled his friend's engines. Placing his arm around him, Ida told Shoto that he had nothing to apologize for. One of the heroes moved over to Dobby, wondering how the villain could possibly still be alive in such a ruined state. Dobby was still unmoving, but unknown to everyone, something sinister had begun to fester inside the motionless Dobby. But that is just part one of this insane story. Subscribe to Plot Armor with notifications on to be here for the real conclusion.